Our text covers a time of celebration, a time where rewards for hard work and faithfulness were being distributed. One man, in the midst of the distribution of land and the giving out of rewards, courageously spoke up for himself. He had no advocate. He had a memory. Amen. He had history on his side, but he had no one to speak for him. Now listen to this. This is very important. Very important. That was Possibly ugliness about to take place in the midst of the beautiful distribution of land. They had wandered in the wilderness. That was over. Those who was 20 year old and upward had died in the wilderness. Okay? Also, the seven-year conquest of the land of Canaan by now was over. All that was left to do was to divvy up the goods or to give out the inheritance. Israel stood in great victory. Uh, Joshua had defeated over 30 to 31, 32 kings. And uh, God had used them greatly. So it's payday. It's a big day. God bless you, Your Honor. Edmonds. God bless you, sir. Dr. Gillum. We're honored to have you in our midst today. Chief Justice. That means a lot. Say amen somewhere. The expositors said this about the con our contextual setting. The amount of space devoted to the description of the territory of each of the tribes and the order of presentation corresponds to the importance of each particular tribe in Israel's history. Accordingly, Judah in chapter 15 the tribe of David and Solomon and their successors is treated most thoroughly. Then the tribes of Joseph, which are considered, who so predominated the northern kingdom that Ephraim became one of its names, is dealt with in chapter 16. The third and last tribe to be given special treatment is Benjamin. The tribe of Saul, Israel's first king. So if you read these chapters, you see how they gave attention to these leading tribes as they gave them land. Before these tribes could get their land, and I want you to pay close attention, we find Caleb speaking up. Now, the reason I say that possible ugliness was about to take place is that had not Caleb courageously spoken up for himself, he could have possibly been overlooked. The serious Bible student understands this. 
Um, one of the reasons I say this is because of the construction of the sixth verse in our text. Notice how it is constructed, how it is written. District Missionary, it says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. Right? You see that? And Caleb. The children of Judah and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. Going slow, but we'll go fast in just a moment. The children of Judah and Caleb came to Joshua, who by now was Israel's leader. Moses was dead. God had said seven years prior, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. And the conquest of Canaan had taken place. Joshua is in his strength. The battle is fought and the victories are won. Uh, were won. And verse 6 says that the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. Now, let's compare this to the initial introduction of Caleb in Scripture. If you turn to Numbers chapter 13, we see Caleb, this Caleb, introduced in Scripture for the first time. And uh, that is a rule in Bible study that's called the law of first mention. More is told, the strength of a person, the, the person's position, their advantage position, the ultimate truth about that individual is given when they are first mentioned. So let's look at when Caleb was first mentioned. Numbers chapter 13. This is when they were selecting spies to spy out the land of Canaan. Am I right? The Bible says in the sixth verse, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Of the tribe of Judah. Of the tribe of Judah. Representing the tribe of, of Judah. A member of the tribe of Judah. Judah's only representer, representer, re representative to spy out the land and bring back a report was Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. What is clear is the stress, the emphasis of Caleb's origin was the tribe of Judah, which is a part of Israel. Because he was their God to spy out the land. If you read on in chapter 13, you will uh, read, you will not read where anyone else represented Judah to spy out the land of Canaan. And that all of the representatives who represented those tribes were members of those tribes. So when Judah is, when Caleb is first mentioned, he's introduced as a member 
of the tribe of Judah. But when they began to distribute the land, we find the text saying that the children of Judah, or the tribe of Judah, came unto Joshua in Gilgal and Caleb. Why not just say the tribe of Judah? And notice in Numbers, he's Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. But in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, he's Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. So there is another level of identification and the stress when you, when you look at where he was from or his origin was clearly not Judah. But it was not that he was Judean, but that he was a Kenizzite. Something ugly. Could have been going on. Can't prove a negative, but it could have been that he would have been overlooked. Either way, he felt the need. See, I wasn't there, but he felt the need to speak up for himself. How am I doing? Follow me now. Follow me now. Let's talk about Jephunneh, his dad. The name Jephunneh literally means for whom a way is prepared. Clearly, the emphasis of origin was the tribe of Judah in Numbers chapter 6. Chapter 13, excuse me, in the 6th verse. Now, let me be fair to the text. Fairness to the subject. Moses did refer to Caleb. He did refer to him as the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. One time, as he reasoned and persuaded the tribes of Reuben and Gad to cross over with him from the east side of Jordan, to go back over to the west side to help them fight. See, two of the 12 tribes did not make their home in the land of Canaan on the west side of the Jordan River. For they discovered that the land on the east side was better for their cattle. And they were herdmen. So they decided, we don't want to cross over into the land of Canaan on the west side. We want to stay on the east side. Moses was clearly disturbed at their request. And he said to them, if you do this, you will discourage the rest of the children of Israel. I need every hand on deck. This is not the time to go AWOL. This is not the time to go missing. This is not the time to be somewhere else. For if two of the 12 decide not to cross over, and Moses now, our great general, is already dead. Two defections may disturb the remaining nine. And see, we need everybody's heart in the right place to cross over. He said, now, you remember what happened in the provocation in the wilderness when the spies brought back a report and how God brought us out of Egypt and, uh, and, uh, and, and the spies brought us to Kadesh Barnea in 11 days. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. It could have been, only been 11 days. But you didn't believe 
the good report that came from Joshua and Caleb. That's what Moses said. And Moses says, nobody believed us, verse 12 of Numbers 32, save Caleb, the son of Jephani, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun. For they wholly followed the Lord. They wholly followed the Lord. Moses here intentionally inserted that Caleb was a Kenizzite, but for different reasons than it is mentioned in our text. By saying only Caleb, the son of Jephani, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, brought back the good report. That was his way of saying Caleb believed even though he was a non-Israeli. See, you ought not to let members of the church, you who are members, let me rephrase this, you who are long-time members, you know holiness. You know how to believe God. You've been taught how to believe. Y'all not to let somebody come in off the street and get your miracle. And, and you're supposed to be a veteran in God. See, he says, now, if the Kenizzite could bring back a good report, the rest of the spies should have. So I want to be fair to it. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Now, are you really with me? I want you to see this. Now, let's, let's go back to Jephani for a minute. Remember, his name is for whom the way is prepared. He was indeed the Imitish of the Imitish tribe called the Kenizzites. This is Caleb's dad. Kenaz was the founder of the Kenizzites. According to Joshua chapter 15 and verse 17, Caleb and his brother Ophniel were descendants of Kenaz. According to Genesis 36 and 11, Kenaz was a descendant, follow me now, of Esau. Esau, according to Genesis 36 and 1, is Edom. The Kenizzites were Edomites. The father of Edom was Esau. The Jews were the descendants of Jacob. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. The Edomites was also called Mount Seir. Remember in the days of Jehoshaphat? When among the people who tried to invade Judah were the people of Mount Seir. Are you following me? Edom was a mountainous country, about 100 miles long and 20 miles broad. It was the Edomites who flatly refused. You can study this when you get home. They flatly refused to allow Israel to cross over their borders as Israel was on its way to the land of promise. As a matter of fact, Moses says, we won't eat your food without paying you. We won't take anything of yours without paying you. We would just like to pass through. It was the Edomites who said, no, we won't even let you walk across our land. You know what Moses did? He went around. It was a very cruel thing. And, uh, you know, Moses could have fought. But he went around the Edomites. Read it in Numbers chapter 20. For a 400-year period... We do not hear from the Edomites. And then they were attacked and defeated by Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Attacked 40 years later again by David in 2 Samuel chapter 8. 
Lastly, they did something that was cruel. And, and I'm saying lastly, there are so many other things. When Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, the Edomites partnered with the Babylonians against Israel. There's so much history that I could share with you concerning Judah and the Edomites who were the Kenizzites. But I think this will kind of clinch it for you. With all of the bad blood that were between the Israel, Israelis and the people of Edom, from a standpoint of origin, the Edomites and the Israelites were first cousins. For their fathers were brothers. The two sons of Isaac. Their mother was Rebecca. While in the womb of Rebecca, the brothers fought. Good God Almighty. And while they were in a state of innocence, according to Romans chapter 9, God made a decision. Bible said before either of the boys could do either good nor evil, it was determined that the elder would serve the younger. Isn't that something? And so when you read the story, it was Esau the father of the Edomites, father uh, of the Kenizzites, where Jephunneh was from. It was Esau who sold his birthright to Jacob for a morsel of meat. Esau did that. It was Esau who got had. When he was out hunting, Rebecca took Jacob, dressed him like he was Esau, brought him in to his daddy Isaac, whose eyes were dim, and tricked Isaac into giving Jacob Esau's blessing. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. And then Esau came in later and said, I know that you have, you got to have at least one more blessing for me. Amen. The history of the two is amazing. So in our text, we see that Jephani, the Kenizzite, which was an Edomite, was Caleb's father. But when Caleb is initially introduced, the origin of emphasis was on the tribe of Judah, not on the, the origin of his dad. But again, now that it's time to pay up, all of a sudden, he's a Kenizzite. Ah. So Caleb was... In our text, he's identified as a non-Israelite, or at least a half-Israelite. This is why I say some ugliness could have been about to take place. I'm almost through. Let's look at Caleb for a moment. The man who courageously spoke up for himself. And today I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak up for yourself. You can bind the devil for yourself. You can, you can declare some things for yourself. But you can't do it in passivity. You've got to speak up in faith. Courageously believe in God. Then you've got to be willing to live a certain way. Caleb said three times. From verse 6 to verse 14. 
I wholly follow the Lord with all my heart. See, you know, we don't put enough emphasis today on living it. We talk about claiming it by faith. We talk about all the things, but we don't talk about living right. It's almost like I told them today in 8 o'clock class, you know, we keep saying we need to have a conversation. Everybody wants a conversation now. A conversation in this country. We need to have a conversation with law enforcement and a conversation with this group and a conversation with that group. And we need to retrain the police. And we need to do this and we need to do that. But I think that if we're going to have a conversation, we might start the conversation. Just might. This is a novel idea. We might start with saying to the lawless, obey the law. I mean, you know, I mean, you know I'm just saying. I'm, that might go a long way. A long way. Do you think? A long way. Toward not having a clash with the police at all. My daddy died in the hands of the police. They said that he hung himself from his shoestrings, but he had on slip on shoes. But he was in that life. The drug dealer, drug user, he was in that life. We ought to tell our boys and girls not to get in that life. I can't be bitter. I can't be mad. What were the lessons I learned? Stay out the life. That's my advice to you. So we're going to retrain the police. Retrain the thug. Retrain the lawbreaker. Let me get back to this. I think when I throw in these things, that's when I make my enemies. Wooden doesn't understand. As black as I am. I've been African American all my life, all 55 years. Born poor, poor, raised on welfare. But when I figured out what was going on, Found out that I could work. I fell in love with the dignity of earning. I fell in love with the notion that I could stand eye to eye with any man, white, black, any man, and be a man just like him. And sit at the table and say to him, I don't want your hand out. I can make it on my own. Experience this message in its entirety by calling toll-free 877-463-3477 to purchase your copy in CD or DVD format. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.